So just to give you a little bit of idea uh, about uh, me, uh, so I am from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Kharagpur, and uh, I basically lead the SWAN lab, the Smart Wireless Applications and Networking Lab there. And um, so this particular lab, as many of you probably already are aware, uh, not only in our country, but also globally, uh, is quite prominent um, uh, in terms of uh, the research, the different types of research that are being done uh, on uh, IoT. So our focus in this lab is particularly on the networking aspects. However, we also do some application-oriented projects. Uh, so for example, we have been executing uh, projects in the healthcare, uh, we are quite, uh, you know, so uh, we, we have uh, quite a few achievements in the healthcare domain. We have also done some, uh, you know, application oriented works on agriculture, uh, underwater domain, and so on. So, you know, so like this, actually, uh, mining also is another one. Like this, actually, there are so many different, uh, uh, you know, uh, projects that we have been executing since the last couple of years. Uh, however, you know, our main focus is basically the, the, the core research. Uh, on the networking aspects, right? So the uh, not, I mean, so uh, so application oriented aspects are of interest to us. But uh, I think uh, you know most of our students take uh, uh, more interest on the actual innovations that have to be brought in uh, to enable uh, the networking of the different IoT devices. So uh, this is uh, basically I do uh, what I do, and uh, today um, along with me uh, there are. Uh, uh, two, uh, two other uh, uh, researchers from the SWAN lab who are also present, who will be presenting um, some kind of a tutorial uh, after my talk. Uh, so, uh, so one is Dr. Nujaman Ahmed. He is a postdoctoral fellow working with me in the SWAN lab. And uh, another PhD scholar, um, uh, Mr. Ponteo Sarkar. <clears throat> so both of them, they will be presenting a tutorial on some of the uh, advanced aspects of uh, networking of IoT. Uh, so something called um, you know, programming of IoT, programmable IoT, and uh, also software-defined uh, networking for IoT. So uh, right now, actually, uh, my talk is being pitched for uh, those of you who are new to IoT, and who would like to get exposed to what is out there and the kind of research, you know, so it's a little bit of exposure about the introductory aspects and uh, the, the different types of research that are being conducted uh, around with IoT and so on. So just in the sake of, uh, you know, for the sake of completeness, uh, let me just uh, give you a little bit of introduction uh, in terms of definition, uh, what is IoT, basically uh, IoT, there are, there is no one standard definition of IoT, by the way, right? So there are so many different definitions floating around for IoT. And, uh, you know, partly probably due to the way IoT evolved over the years, right from its beginning. Um, so probably due to that, or uh, uh, may, there may be many other reasons. Uh, so we still do not have a single standard also for IoT, right? So there are so many different uh, efforts that are being uh, undertaken uh, towards standardization. Um, you know, there are some uh, bits and pieces of uh, standardization efforts on certain myopic aspects of IoT, but IoT as a whole, there is no uh, single standard that we can talk about. Um, so what is this IoT? So there are so many different perspectives of IoT, but in general, uh, you know, so what uh, uh, people think about IoT is basically, as the name suggests, Internet of Things. So it's basically an internet working of different things, right? This is what people try to uh, uh, think of IoT to be. So internet, internet working of different things. And uh, these things are basically the physical things, anything and everything that you can think of, right? So right from the toothbrush that we all have used in the morning to, uh, you know, uh, to the different uh, things like the air conditioning system of the room, uh, the heating system, the air conditioning system, the lights, the cars, the, the, uh, the different other vehicles, uh, you know, if you are visiting a hospital, the different uh, infrastructure in the hospital, or anything and everything that you can think of are all candidate things uh, in the domain of Internet of Things. So IoT is basically an internet work of different things. So it's a connected network. It's a connected network system um, and of embedded objects and devices. So basically all these physical objects, 
the whole idea is that for certain reasons you want to connect all of them together in the form of a single single network or a, a big internet work right and this in the interconnection has to be done in such a way that there is seamlessness in terms of connectivity so basically you know even if you have a lot of heterogeneity if you have a lot of disparity in terms of the network devices protocols standards etc but this connectivity end to end has to be uh, you know very seamless so this is the whole idea so seamless interconnectivity of different physical uh, uh, you know embedded uh, objects and devices uh, with uh, uh, with identifiers so these devices and the objects they also need to have certain identifiers right in the same way as in the in the field of computers and that uh, you know computer networks basically we have um, these computers having different uh, ip addresses for uh, identification here also in the domain of internet of things we need some kind of an identifier so uh, the other important aspect to highlight is that uh, this system should be completely autonomous there should not be any human intervention ideally uh, so this is what people strive to achieve in terms of uh, you know autonomy so people try to achieve complete autonomy however in practice uh, it is often uh, felt that uh, you know complete autonomy is difficult so people strive to achieve like you know uh, partial autonomy of the system that they develop so uh, and uh, so there there are different uh, you know isolated standards isolated communication protocols that are there so they all will have to be fit into this particular framework and uh, as i said before that the communication in, uh, you know the communication network will be completely seamlessly connected and in a ideally fully autonomous manner Uh, so like this actually there are many other definitions floating all around if you search in the internet you will find lots of different varieties of different definitions of iot so consequently what happens is that uh, you know if at any time you are asked like or if i am asked what is iot i cannot really be very precise about what iot is i cannot tell that only this much is iot this is not and so on so uh, because that's not the case right so there are so many different there are so many uh, different um, uh, did, did anybody try to speak anything okay so um, so there are so many different um, view points that will also have to be included i cannot really say that uh, only this much is iot and this is not and so on and so forth right and another thing that i would also like to highlight the beauty of iot is the issue of ubiquity right so so you know i might be sitting Uh, in uh, kharagpur and uh, you know i might be able to uh, get the data or even operate upon a particular machine or a device that might be located uh, over my iot network uh, let us say in some remote part of the world let us say in los angeles or somewhere else right so you know so it's basically you know it's going to be a completely ubiquitous kind of uh, network and this is already happening this is something that is the beauty of iot and uh, you know we have already experienced this uh, in different projects right so uh, so so this is so far so good but the main problem is that already with the computers we were running out of the identifiers right we were run, running out of the ip address um, we were seeing that with the growth in the number of computers ipv4 uh, uh, became insufficient right in terms of the addressing space so ipv Four evolved into IPv6, IPv6, IPNG, and so on. Uh, but uh, even those latter ones also uh, are these are also not very suitable for use in IoT networks. The reason is that uh, you know when we are talking about interconnectivity of things, uh, the, the number of such things basically explode, right? So what happens is that if you are talking about just one home, right? If you are talking about a smart home kind of application, in just one home. we uh, we can have large number of devices right so if you want to really interconnect all of them uh, the number of such devices will run into hundreds and then if you are talking about like a city scale kind of network uh, with all the smart homes interconnected so the number of such devices from all the homes you know in a city uh, the, the number of such homes is going to run, run into several tens of thousands so tens of thousands times each Uh, home having hundreds of devices hundreds of appliances hundreds of devices so how you are going to offer separate uh, you know addresses unique addresses to each of them 
so uh, you know so uh, so basically you know what is happening is already with the computers we were uh, the humans were becoming the minority and the number of computers was becoming the majority and uh, then when we are getting into the world of iot uh, here uh, due to the number of such appliances and devices and so on and so forth being interconnected this problem is basically exaggerated right so this problem becomes much more right so uh, how do you handle uh, this kind of problem and this addressing issue is one thing that i told you like this actually the scalability in general uh, in terms of everything that you can think of in terms of networks um, you know these are actually problems that are very much pertinent to iot research so in the future we are getting into a world where there are going to be millions of applications that are going to be supported by billions of smart systems and run on trillions of sensors so we are getting into such a world right already with 2008 and so there were more number of connected devices than people and that i actually i think by now everybody knows about it and in the iot world as i was telling you a short while back in the iot world what is going to happen is this number of iot devices interconnected you know sensor enabled devices are thrown into billions and trillions and the problem is such that you do not know really how to develop such a network <coughs> so how do we handle this problem so this is one aspect we will come to it once again so our government several years back you know the present government it started its work on developing smart cities so we it started with the vision of 100 smart cities different smart cities got developed in phases some sit, some smart cities were like brownfield cities as they call which means that you know the the old cities the previous you know the the, the conventional cities those were technologically transformed to comply with some of the requirements of smart cities whereas some other cities were being or are being developed from scratch so these are called greenfield cities so whether it is brownfield or greenfield smart city projects are already you know developed these are being developed and throughout the country we have many smart city projects that are being currently executed and many of them uh, are uh, you know say so these those uh, many some of these projects are already in higher levels of maturity compared to the other projects not only in our country smart city projects are going on around the world <clears throat> people are talking talking about developing smart homes smart cities and so on so you know irrespective of uh, you know which smart city you are talking about and where which part of the world it may be located one thing is very important it's how the smart cities are developed so one of the core technological components for developing a city into a smart city is the use of iot so this is where iot is attractive internet of things so essentially with the help of these smart uh, you know uh, or or the sensor enabled interconnected devices what you can do is you can transform the different segments of a city for example you can transform a hospital into a smart hospital you can transform the traffic system into a smart traffic system so that you have smart you know monitoring of the traffic surveillance and so on you can transform the you know power sector into you know smart power sector with uh, energy management appropriate energy management and so on and so forth like this actually you can think about smart you know different things for example judiciary you can have smart judiciary you can have um you know smart uh, hotels and uh, what not right so anything and everything you can think about uh, to be transformed into your smart counterparts so iot is one of the many different technologies that are required in this transformation iot is not the only enabler for developing smart cities by the way iot is only one of the 
uh, one of the uh, enabling technologies for the development of smart cities. So, when you talk about IoT and IoT enabled smart cities, we are talking about smart governance. We are talking about, you know, maybe smart agriculture, smart living for sure, smart people, smart economy, smart mobility, smart environment, and many other smart X, Y, Z. So many, many other smart aspects are possible, right? In a typical smart city. Now, the, the beauty of these smart cities and IoT enabled smart cities is that unlike the traditional counterpart where you know, things were not interconnected, here there are some beautiful use cases that come up which make these IoT-based uh, solutions very attractive. So for example, let me give you uh, one, uh, you know, one of the uh, examples from real life. So many times, you know, nowadays it is not happening due to the pandemic, but many times previously, those of us who have our kids going to the school, in the early in the morning, we drop our children in our cars to the school. Some of the children, they go by school bus or other vehicles. But while we are working in our offices or while we are at home, we are very much concerned about whether number one, my child is studying properly. Number two, the, the health condition of my child, whether my child hurts himself or herself while playing, right? So like this, actually, there are many concerns that are there. So let us say that accidentally, some child hurts himself while at school. While, while you know during playing, let us say during the games and uh, sports, they hurt themselves. So typically, you know, conventionally, what happens? The school will call. The school will call the parents. You know, probably the school will first call the ambulance. The ambulance comes, takes the child. School will call manually the parents. Okay, and they will inform. We you know so we being concerned about the welfare of our child. You know, hurriedly we'll be rushing through the huge traffic in a city and trying to reach the hospital to see you know, what is going on, right? So this is a typical kind of thing that uh, uh, happens and it, it, it happens to many, many of us. However, in the IoT world, if you are talking about a smart city, then what will happen is that you can have certain use cases which, will, which are very attractive and will cut across different application verticals. So for example, if I have a smart city implementation, while my child is in the school, I would be able to get all the details about number one, whether my child is studying sincerely or not, whether my child is attending the classes or not, whether my child is hurting himself or herself or not. In case there is an accident, I, I would like to get notified automatically not waiting for the school to call me and inform me. Automatically, if something happens to my child, I should be from my mobile phone, I should be able to know the condition of my child. I should, you know, when the child is being taken to the, uh, in an ambulance, you know, I should be able to continuously monitor the condition of my child. Uh, you know, which hospital the child is being taken to. Uh, you know, whether there are some doctors who are already seeing my child or not. You know, if while the, uh, the patient or the child is being carried uh, in the ambulance, at that time, you know, I would, I would be interested to know whether, uh, you know, there is any road, roadside traffic jam uh, congestion that is happening. So like this, actually, there are many interesting questions that might be answered very comfortably, very easily in an attractive manner if we have proper implementation of smart cities, IoT-enabled smart cities, right? So these, I mean, these are only a few questions that I mentioned. Like this, actually, you may be able to come up with a lot of interesting use cases of the implementation of IoT to develop smart cities. Not only smart cities, actually, similar kind of questions you can ask in the other things also. Okay, other um, uh, you can ask in the uh, other uh, different uh, in, uh, applications of IoT as well, and you would be able to come up with interesting use cases.
So the beauty is that in this particular example that I was giving you, this particular use case of continuously monitoring my child cross, uh, sorry, uh, 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 cuts across different application verticals like education, like transportation, because the child has to be taken in an ambulance. So on the road, uh, you know, what is the condition of the road, congestion, etc. So transportation. Number three is healthcare, obviously. And like this, actually, you might be able to think a little deeper and you'll be able to come up with different other verticals where this particular use case is going to cut through, right? So what is required is to have some kind of a convergence of different application verticals, some kind of a convergence of application domains. So, so cross domain convergence is very important, right? So uh, you see that implementation of IoT, deployment of IoT systems is not trivial, right? So if you have to address interesting use cases, then you, know, you need to really develop them. And development of such use cases, I mean, uh, development of systems addressing different use cases like this is not very trivial, it's challenging, and it will take several years in order to uh, come up with interesting solutions. Now, let us go a little deeper and try to understand this issue of uh, addressing that I was mentioning earlier. So IP address, there is a problem, right? So how do, we, how do we come up with a different addressing scheme? So towards this, actually, there are a lot of initiatives around the world um, uh, that uh, different researchers, uh, they have taken. And uh, so there are so many consortia, industry, uh, uh, academia consortia, and different academic uh, research labs also have been working on to come up with different solutions for addressing. So there are two viewpoints of developing uh, IoT uh, systems. One is that whatever existing internet you have, you know, you just extend it, you just, you just scale it up in order to accommodate these new IoT devices. So basically, you know, you are trying to uh, you know, scale up the existing internet, right? So this is one way in which you can, uh, you know, develop your new IoT network. And the other way is basically to develop a completely separate internet work from scratch, right? So you have a separate internet work of IoT devices, which are going to be uh, developed from scratch. Right? So there are a lot of initiatives, you know, there are a lot of viewpoints, you know, there are pros and cons in both, right? And so many different initiatives, which basically prefer one over other. There are so many recommendations also that are floating around. Uh, but uh, one thing is required, one thing is common in both is how do you address, right? If you are extending and expanding the existing internet, then obviously, you know, you will have to go with the existing, uh, uh, you know, existing IP addressing mechanisms. So whether you want to interconnect IPv6 with IPv4 existing traditional v4 networks, then IPv6 or whatever. So whatever be it, you know, so you have to address and addressing is a, a huge problem in this particular uh, domain. So this is one. Uh, the other aspect is if you are developing something from scratch, then what will be this new addressing mechanism? You do not really, really need to fall back on the traditional IP addressing mechanism, right? So what will be the new? So there are so many different proposals that are floating around. One of the one of the uh, uh, you know, interesting ways of addressing is called use of attribute value pairs, right? So attribute value pairing, right? So it is a completely different way of thinking about how the addressing is going to be done. Uh, so, uh, so like this, actually, there are so many different uh, you know, innovative ways in which people are trying to come up with new ways of uh, resolving this traditional problem of addressing in the internet. Any question? Yeah, so we talked about having a separate internet world just for the IoT devices. Right now, with the trend in which we are going, most of the devices that we are using today are getting converted into IoT devices. So essentially, the next gen uh, uh, devices have been replaced by IoT devices. Then how is it efficient to build a new world of so, internet just for IoT? These are also devices? actually different perspectives. You are very right, as I also said. These are different perspectives, and there are pros and cons of both. So the way, as you have rightly said, that the way things have been moving forward uh, is basically, uh, you know, you can think of IoT as an extension of your existing internet, right? So this is 
what is happening so you what you do is whether you build it in your lab or uh, you know you procure something some iot device so ultimately it is it has to fit into the existing internet right so this is the way uh, th i mean so ultimately you know it has to get some kind of an ip address or something similar and this is how it is happening um, but uh, there is already a problem right so there is already a problem of uh, this ip uh, addressing based uh, addressing mechanism um, so 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 that is the reason actually people have been uh, trying to think about what are the what would be the other ways in which uh, these are actually in the research stage right most of the as you have said that most of the commercially available ones are still falling back on the existing internet to be connected okay sir okay sir so uh, you know so uh, yeah uh, so now the the point is that uh, you know how do you uh, uh, form the architecture of uh, iot right so what what would be the architecture of iot so unlike let us say osi for the internet or tcp ip for the internet you know so here uh, you know we do not have similar kind of uh, you know layered architecture here we do not have something similar it is not standardized also so there are different proposals uh, floating around in different research papers and white papers so one of these uh, basically talks about and this is a very commonly used one that is why i i picked it up so one of these basically talks about uh, these different uh, four layers right so these four layers in the iot stack so at the very bottom you have the sensing layer then comes the network layer then comes the service layer and then the interface layer so uh, as you see that sensing layer is a new one so there was no sensing layer in the osi or tcp ip so here you have a sensing layer and this is uh, basically a very important layer because uh, iot one of the important functionalities is basically sensing right so continuous sensing you have a dedicated layer for it sensing layer this network layer we have seen this term um, in the context of uh, osi as well as uh, tcp ip reference architectures for the internet Uh, but the uh, the scope of the internet uh, the network layer over there as well as the scope uh, of the network layer here are basically different right so so here basically the network layer talks about these isolated networks right so separate networks like wireless local area network like wireless sensor networks like cellular networks other mobile networks and so on so these are basically part of this network layer right so so basically the perspective is different although the name is the same the network layer right acha so that's the layer 2 then layer 3 is the surface layer this layer is also you know we have not come across similar names in the context of osi or tcp ip so here you have a separate layer surface layer and why we need the surface layer this is a very important thing this is a very important layer see iot is all about surfaces right so why do you want to uh, you know why do you want to adopt iot based systems uh in your applications because uh, because you want to offer improved services whether you are talking about smart cities or smart homes or anything anything else that is smart right so you want to basically offer improved services so there is a dedicated service layer yeah. that is proposed over here then on top you have the interface layer so interface layer basically talks about something very similar to what we used to have in the uh, as the application layer in the osi so very similar to that is the interface layer you can think of it as very similar to the application layer where different applications and apps etc etc are going to execute so this is basically the detailed view of all these different four layers at the very bottom you have the sensing layer with the rfids intelligent sensors and ble devices etc these are all part of so these basically these these different sensing devices this this the sense and they throw the data uh, which will have to be uh, sent to the network layer which will be used by the network layer the data are going to be sent to some network like let us say internet or mobile network cellular network or whatever be the network so the data is going to be sent through the network layer uh, then uh, there is the service layer which is going to talk about how these services are going to be offered different services are going to be formed the services are going to be integrated divided uh, and uh, different you know manipulations and uh, you know uh, these different uh, different types of uh, execution of these different services are going to be uh, offered uh, so this is the service layer and on top as i was telling you you have you are talking about the apis the front ends and um, and so on and so forth so cutting across all these different layers is the security right so only security is mentioned but i would tell 
I would I I I I would like to think of it this way that it is not just the security but security, privacy, trust, all the three S P and T. Uh, so S P and T basically cut across uh, uh, all these different four layers, right? So you have to ensure that if you are talking about service layer, let us say, right? You have to ensure that these requirements of security, privacy, and trust are taken care of. Okay, is this clear? Any question on this part? What is the social network in the network? Uh, these are actually, uh, yeah, yeah. These are actually like you know. So this is not Facebook or Twitter, <laughs> right? So this is basically. Uh, these uh, normal like you know social uh, uh, different social networks may be formed right so nowadays for example social networks are formed for contact tracing right in the pandemic times so different social networks being formed uh, so these are actually all i mean so between dif different social beings the network that is being formed between different social beings this is also part of the uh, this is also one type of network that is also part of the network layer that is so, again formed underlying network is internet so, say that again the underlying communication mode between these two social beings would be internet. Yeah, so actually there is an overlap as you are rightly thinking. Uh, so there is an internet, it could be internet, it could be something else. It could be, you know, it, it may not be anything. You know? So nowadays uh, there is, um, you know, this concept of something called uh, opportunistic network, right? So, which is not purely internet, but, you know, so, so, so basically, you know, where there is deviation from the assumptions that are made in the internet, right? So, you know, it could be an opportunity. So let us say that, you know, so it could be, you know, you can think of it this way that there is a team of rescuers uh, who collectively do something, right? So there is a disaster and post disaster, there is some rescue effort, right? So the, you know, the network that is formed out of these rescuers, you know, so you can think of it. So they might be using some technologies uh, which will be internet enabled or, uh, you know, wireless enabled or whatever be, right? So, but the thing is, the main idea is that conceptually, these are like different types of networks, right? Okay. Now, um, excuse, me. excuse me, sir. Yes, please. So in the previous slide, uh, in the context of that example which you explained before, uh, mm -hmm. what can you please tell us uh, what happens in the service lab? Uh, Different services. So you have to think about. So I do not know. I mean, so this is this is something that you have to think a little deeper. Uh, so different. So what is the service that is being offered uh, in the in the context of the example that I mentioned? Can you name these services? What are the services being offered? So who are the who are the actors? So let us think of it this way. Who are the actors? Who are the actors and what are the use cases? So use cases is uh, getting notified when something happens to the child. Uh, right. right. Any, uh, if, if the child is eating, if the child is sitting in the class. Correct. Very right. And uh, who are the actors? The parents, right? Uh, the teachers, the, uh, you know, I do not know, maybe uh, these ambulance operators, so like that. So as you can see that, you know, so you can think about these corresponding to these use cases or directly these use cases themselves, these could be the different services, right? The service services being offered with the help of this IoT implementation, right? So how, you know, so some of these services could be you know, if you are talking about like granular level services, they in, uh, to, in order to fulfill a particular use case, these services might have to be integrated together. Okay, they will have to be put together, right? So in order to fulfill a particular use case. Some of these services may have to be divided. Uh, so, you know, so you have to disintegrate some of the services, right? So like that, actually, there are, uh, you know, different manipulations that you can do with these different uh, services, right? In order to, to the requirements of the application that is running on top right so there are different applications are running so in order to uh, perform certain uh, uh, task uh, 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 you know from that application layer so basically you know some of these services will have to be formed and you know so you might be integrating disintegrating or whatever dividing etc you know so like that okay. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, the layers, uh, in could you repeat yeah. i cannot hear you uh, no Am I audible, sir? That, yeah, yeah. Now you are. Say that again. Uh, sir, uh, the interconnecting security layer, which are interconnecting. No, 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 no. This uh, part I don't understand. Inter. Uh, like uh, cutting through uh, all the layers. Ah, security. 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 Ah, right, right. So is this the internal version of the like IoT services, or is the security is externally imposed on the network? No, no. This is basically just a representative thing over here. 
So what it means is that you have to ensure that security is taken care of in each of these different layers, right? In the sensing layer, in the network layer, in the service layer, in the interface layer, you have to ensure that, you know, let us say that you are talking about just simple sensing, right? So whether that sensing is secured sensing or not. In the network layer, you are talking about, let us say that somebody talked about social network, right? So whether that social network offers adequate levels of security or not, right? So you have to, you have to come up with uh, protocols that will ensure security in that social network. So like that, actually, you have to ensure security in each and everything that you can think of uh, in this kind, uh, you know, in this kind of framework. Any other question, sir? Did the protocols used in the network layer is uh, similar to TCP/IP, or else a separate set of protocols are uh, followed for uh, no, the services? Right, right. No, so so uh, so basically, uh, this particular representation doesn't talk about you know whether you are talking about TCP/IP or you know whatever it is. See, if you are talking about TCP/IP, then you know so the network that is used is the internet, right? Yes. Sir. So we are not talking about that. This is just a representation to show that you know. So these are the four layers that will have to be implemented now in that network layer if you are using internet as your communication network if you are using internet obviously there is this tcp ip that will come into picture right however if you are talking about let us say a well a sensor network right internet may not be relevant over there okay so it, it all depends right so it's a it's a different viewpoint it's a different perspective of conceiving the different layers for IoT. It's, you know, you cannot really map to the OSI layers. Okay, okay. sir. Thank you. Okay, can we go forward? Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is where we were at. Um, so you see that ultimately, uh, you know, so IoT is all about sensing, right? And maybe there might be some actuation based on the, the, the sensed data that are received, processing of the data based on the processed data. There might be some actuation that may be required. So as shown in this particular figure, so you have some kind of a sensor network at the very bottom. So this sensor network basically continuously throws data out from these deployed devices. So these data will have to be dealt with. So like when, IoT was becoming popular. At the same time, another technology that was becoming very popular is the cloud computing. So cloud computing became very popular in the last 10 years, right? Now it is, it is, you know, it is something that is not in the research stages anymore. It is something that is very much used everywhere. Almost everywhere people are using cloud. Even like the student, students are also using cloud, right? In their uh, in academic uh, assignments. Right? So everybody is using cloud now. So you see that sensor network was good in terms of data acquisition. So you acquire the data and then you have to do something with the data. So conventionally, the data would have to be thrown into some kind of a network, uh, some kind of a server. But with the popular popularization of cloud computing, uh, what is being done is that because cloud is very good in terms of storage, in terms of processing power and so on. And there are a number of other benefits of cloud also, but because of these different advantages of cloud, the integration of this sensor network or the sensors with cloud basically provides a very robust mechanism of not only data sensing and dissemination, but also processing and storage. So processing and storage, powerful processing and storage mechanisms are offered by cloud computing through different technologies such as you know, virtualization, uh, then uh, you know, uh, different other, uh, you know, different other uh, constituent technologies. Uh, plus there are different models, you know, conventional models of software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and so on and so forth. And on top, basically, runs these different applications that we were talking about earlier, right? So this is 
this IoT cloud integrated framework that everybody talks about nowadays. So earlier, if you recall, when I started, I started with the definition of IoT and I said that ideally these systems, these IoT based systems should have full autonomy. So that means that there should not be any human intervention of any kind during the operations of these systems. So earlier, several years back, there was this concept of autonomic computing, which was becoming very popular. So companies like IBM, et cetera, they worked on autonomic computing. Autonomic computing became very popular. So part of this concept of autonomic computing were different properties such as, you know, self-configuration, self-healing, you know, self-optimization, et cetera, et cetera, which were basically proposed as part of this vision of autonomic computing. So those properties and few others which are similar, these have been basically also proposed in order to grant full autonomy to these different IoT-based systems. So in other words, there are some, uh, some of these features that are listed on this slide that you can see, which are ideal features, which are desirable features to have fully autonomous IoT systems. So the IoT systems that we develop, we should strive to build the systems to be self, uh, you know, self-adaptive. They should be self-organized, self-configuring, self-healing, self-describing, self-optimizing, self-protecting, self-discovering, self-matchmaking, and so on and so forth. Right? So these are some of these different self properties, which basically ideally should be implemented on these uh, IoT systems. Okay. Now, yeah, okay. Now, I'm getting some part of my screen masked sometimes. Yeah, okay, now it is better, okay. Now let us try to think about the building blocks for IoT, right? So for the internet, we already you know, know that uh, you know, there are different building blocks like the nodes, uh, you know, nodes means like the different network devices, et cetera. The nodes, the gateways, the proxies, uh, then, then different types of networks like LAN, WAN, MAN, et cetera. So here also, conceptually, you have to modular, modularize this entire network architecture. Whereas in the internet, we have all these concepts. Here also in IoT, whether you are extending the existing internet or whether you are developing a separate internet network from scratch, you know, we need to have this IoT node, IoT gateway, IoT proxy, local area network, wide area network, and so on and so forth. Very analogous to what we have as our internet counterpart. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, let us quickly have a look through a simple prototype of an IoT, uh, uh, you know, implementation. So uh, you see that all of us we have our smartphones. These smartphones, as many of us we already are aware, that they come with different sensors. Some three, four, five, six sensors are all there in most of the modern smartphones. Sensors such as temperature sensor, humidity sensor, uh, then accelerometer sensor, gyroscope, uh, camera sensor. So like that, actually many sensors are. Uh, they are in these modern smartphones. <laughs> Excuse me. So, so what we have, we have sensor enabled smartphones. Now, the sensor enabled smartphones, we can utilize them in order to sense whatever they are supposed to sense. So these sensors can be activated on the smartphones. These sensors are going to continuously sense the data and through the data, uh, uh, you know, out of, uh, these devices. These data would be sent through the existing internet or a separate network or any other network and would be taken to either um, uh, you know, a, 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 a regular server or the cloud nowadays, you know, everybody is using cloud. So basically, you know, you can connect your mobile phone to the cloud and at the cloud server, <coughs> this data is could be processed at the cloud server this data could be processed. So based on the processing, you know, whatever uh, is the result, so some kind of an actuation or some kind of a feedback can be sent back to the origin, uh, 
that means the, the original smartphone, or it can be sent elsewhere for doing something else. So some kind of an actuation or very something something very similar would be done based on the results of analysis. So one is with the smartphone send sensors. You can uh, just let me complete this, then I will take your question. So the other possibility is that you could build once you have, you know, so this is like a small student project, right? And this doesn't, doesn't cost anything. So you can very well, you know, so nowadays cloud facilities are there everywhere, even academic campuses also have their own cloud or they have subscribed to some cloud and everybody has a smart sensor, you know, smartphone sensor uh, and all of these access to smartphone sensors. So this is an exercise that can be easily done. Now, another thing that will uh, be also interesting and this will cost a little bit of more money is basically to develop a sensor node. So nowadays, you know, all these Arduinos and raspberries are all there. So basically, you know, what you can do is you can use the processor in these devices. You can connect to some sensor, right? Some, you can, there are so many, you know, of the self uh, interesting sensors are all uh, there. So these sensors can be uh, connected and uh, I'm just one. Okay, these sensors could be connected um, and um, uh, yeah, so you can use these sensors and there are so many different communication modules that are also there. Okay, so like Zigbee, etc. You know, these are all available. Right? So what you can do is you can use these and you can build a small sensor node, right? You can build a small sensor node. So this small sensor node has uh, this sensor component, uh, this processor component, and the, the radio component. So all of these are there, right? Uh, so uh, these... Uh, um, just give me a moment. Uh, I'm getting a call. I will just send a message. So uh, yeah. So these uh, these sensor nodes uh, they can send uh, uh, you know the sensed data uh, again to the cloud server. Uh, through the internet and again some analytics simple simple analytics like thresholding based analytics or very simple analytics right uh, doesn't need to be fancy machine learning and all so you know simple analytics like you know computing the average over it a particular time span on time series data or whatever right so you do something and uh, then based on that some actuation can be done right so this is a very again a very simple uh, iot implementation which can be executed right some some kind of a student project yeah, somebody was asking some question. Uh, in the previous slide, when the, the business, the, all the computation happens in the cloud server and the result is sent back to the origin. So is there no involvement of the internet? Or, I mean, how is it, uh, how does? Here actually, as I have shown, here whatever I have shown is basically all through, you know, everything is through the internet, right? Uh, so because this is the way, this, like, you know, so if you are talking about a mobile phone nowadays, right? So either it uses the internet, right? Or it will use your cellular network. So some way it has to communicate. This is the way they have been built, right? So what I was telling earlier, I think if you are trying to relate to that, is that something else has to be developed from scratch that is in the research stages, that is not commercially available yet, right? That's different. That's different from, uh, you know, these things. So now, you know, if you are already using some existing commercial products, you have to use the, 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 the technologies that come with it. You cannot really, go and build something, uh, you know, as you like uh, in these devices, right? That is not possible. The connection between the cloud server to mobile, just, uh, it says WebSocket. So uh, this... No, part... whatever. I mean, so basically it's the internet. You must think of it like, you know, through the internet only all communications happen. Okay. Right. Okay, sir. Okay. So uh, now, so having told all of these things, let me now quickly give you a little bit of idea about what these networks are. Right? So essentially, uh, although theoretically uh, IoT doesn't have to be all wireless, but most of these IoT-based systems that we think about nowadays or the ones that we try to build, these are actually wireless enabled. They're wireless systems, right? So typically these are wireless enabled systems. So these actually, not only these are wireless systems, but also, uh, you know, the kind of wireless uh, network that we uh, experience in these are of a typical type. Okay. 
So let us try to understand, first of all, what are the different types of wireless networks. Uh, so, you know, if you are talking about wireless networks, typically these networks can be classified into two types, right? One is the infrastructure based networks, the other one is the infrastructure less networks. So the cellular networks that we use or the wireless local area networks, you know, these are basically of the infrastructure based type. The reason is that you need to use some fixed infrastructure like base stations or some centralized network manager, et cetera, for the communication to be made happen. So uh, uh, this is one type, but the main problem with this type of network is that you really need to have the existing network infrastructure to be placed. So if you do not already have, you know, so you need time to basically lay the foundation for such kind of uh, infrastructure, right? So you cannot do it in a couple of hours, let us say. So infrastructure less networks are the ones where really you do not need any centralized access point or base station, et cetera. So ad hoc networks are a type of infrastructure less networks uh, where, you know, as you can see on the right hand side figure, bottom right side figure, there is no fixed uh, you know, centralized access point, right? So basically you have only a collection of different nodes. Uh, these nodes, you know, they will be able to, in certain configuration, they will be able to uh, you know, uh, talk to each other, right? So that is the ad hoc network. These are infrastructure less networks. Now, uh, you know, uh, now uh, these ad hoc networks are very interesting because they can be set up very fast. And if you do not already have an existing infrastructure, you do not really need much planning in order to set them up. So, uh, so basically, uh, you know, you just need these nodes to be there, and uh, through certain basic configuration, basically these nodes they can start communicating with each other. So these networks are typically self-organizing and self-configuring, right? And also there are a few other self-properties that also hold good for them. So some of these properties of these ad hoc networks were borrowed forward and were taken forward and uh, were used in something called the wireless sensor networks. In the sensor networks, we can think of the sensor networks to be like you know ad hoc networks with some kind of sensors uh, that are used as one of the components. So these are like sensor enabled, let us say ad hoc networks, right? So although sensor networks do not have to be necessarily ad hoc in nature, but most of these sensor networks that we talk about in the research community, we are talking about ad hoc sensor networks or sensor ad hoc networks as they are typically called. Now, uh, the thing is that here actually you have a large number of sensor nodes in a, in a normal like ad hoc network, you only have like a couple of laptops or a couple of PDAs, et cetera. But when you are talking about a sensor ad hoc network, et cetera, you are talking about the deployment of large number of sensor nodes. So these sensor nodes, you know, they may be, let us say that, you know, for uh, monitoring forest fire, right? So these sensor nodes, they may be uh, placed or thrown or whatever, in some way they could be uh, deployed in a particular terrain of interest. And then they will start, you know, communicating with one another, sensing the data around them, wherever they are deployed and the data are going to be sent uh, to the server or cloud for further processing. Right, so these are basically these sensor nodes, they uh, are uh, like, you know, they, they, they uh, form the network in an ad hoc fashion, fashion and they collaborate with one another, right? And then they measure the condition around their surrounding environments. So these sensed data are then transformed into digital signals and processed to reveal some properties of the phenomena that go, uh, you know, take place around these different sensors. So what you typically have in uh, these ad hoc sensor networks is, uh, a multi-hop kind of communication system. So uh, if, uh, you know, if, if a particular node has certain data that has to be sent to the destination node, and uh, there is, uh, the destination is not within the direct transmission range of this particular sensor node, then it will have to take help of some intermediate nodes uh, in order to, uh, for them to relate the packet from the source node to the destination node. So this is basically this multi-hop path through which the data goes through. Now these uh, sensor networks are of different types, stationary type or, mo or mobile type. So these are all there, but I'm not going to get into the details of those. But uh, one thing that I would like to highlight over here is that each of these sensor nodes, they have a sensing unit, a processing unit, a transceiver unit, a power uh, unit, and a couple of different application dependent units, right? So these are the, this is typically the constitution or of the different components of the sensor node. So why I wanted to mention about uh, the sensor node and the sensor network is that you know, when you are talking about IoT and sensor enabled IoT devices, 
essentially it's a it's a sensor node right so if you are talking about a sensor enabled iot device it is typically a sensor node right and then if you interconnect similar kind of sensor nodes you what you get is a sensor network so you can conceptualize your iot network to be like a sensor network obviously because iot networks and their research on iot networks has evolved uh, much more than the sensor networks uh, you know so there is a lot more to iot networks than the traditional sensor networks people nowadays are not talking about sensor networks much everybody talks about iot networks nowadays but conceptually most of these properties of the sensor networks have been inherited into these iot networks and many more other different features have been uh, made visible so there are different sensors you know so mems based sensors nowadays people are talking about mems based sensors so mems is basically micro electromechanical system so mems is basically the nano counterpart of this so people are talking about mems based sensors mems based sensors so these sensors if you if you are talking about mems based sensors these sensors are very small in size like with respect to the different reference points that are shown so with you know so these are comparable to the size of let us say the fingertip right so in one of the pictures as you can see and that it is comparable to the size of the fingertip so it's very small and even if it is very small even if it is very small it is like a small computing device because it has a very small processor it has uh, a very small communication unit you know so the, it has a very small battery right uh, the, uh, you know it has a very small uh, memory right like that you know so all these different things that a uh, computer has all these different components are also there in the small device small sensor device right so this is what you find also in your modern iot networks and if you are building these iot devices using off the shelf uh, you know open hardware platforms like arduinos etc they are also the same thing arduino itself comes with the processor right so you get the processor you take some sensor node you just put it in one of the pins uh, of that particular arduino so so like that actually you know using certain configuration everything is basically you know so kind of plug and play right so everything which pin does what and to which pin you should connect you know everything nowadays has become very simplified with the popularity of these uh, open hardware platforms like arduino etc right so very similar kind of thing so different applications so right from environment monitoring to uh, to healthcare to industrial uh, condition monitoring uh, you know equipment monitoring etc so everything can be done with the help of uh, these uh, you know uh, these uh, sensor networks this is a typical scenario post disaster scenario in healthcare uh, so what happens is uh, you know there are different patients in different places you know you only have couple of uh, doctors and nurses so how you how do you uh, you know how do you interconnect them right so these different sensors are there so uh, these sensors basically uh, are are fitted to these patients or uh, other infrastructure and doctors and nurses even if they are very few in number with the help of uh, this technology they can remotely continuously together at the same time they can monitor the condition of large number of patients right so this is basically an attractive application of these sensor networks so so all, although uh, you know sensor networks are very attractive there are some common challenges one of the biggest challenges that i see is that of scalability so theoretically uh, you know this is all attractive but uh, uh, you know the attractive to connect all of these nodes and you are talking about hundreds of such nodes thousands of such nodes and so on but there is a uh, there is a uh, limit in terms of the network right so basically you know if you are increasing the number of nodes it has been shown in one of the papers that was published in the itp transactions on communication if i remember the year was 2002 it has been shown that in a multi hub kind of scenario the throughput basically decreases at the rate of 1 over square root of n where n is the number of nodes in the network right so as you can understand that scaling up is very difficult in these networks right but it is required you need to scale up so you need to scale up you have to ensure that acceptable levels of service are offered to the clients in the presence of large number of nodes right so this is what is required and it's a challenge as well it's a research challenge so people are people are working uh, you know different researchers have worked already lot of work has been done and lot of work will uh, eventually be done in future <coughs> to address this issue then comes the issue of sorry yes Can we form micro networks of sensors? As in, it's uh, I understand when it is in large scale and throughput decreases, but there are some places where the sensor networks might be beneficial because there might not be a requirement for any 
a layer and we, we can directly interact with yeah yeah that's right so that's yeah. right so it is required but it's a challenge right so so this is what i told you also that it's required you know there are some benefits but you know so are there applications real time applications that rely on these sensor network? yes 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 of course of course you know there are there are you know so these are like desirable applications but uh, you know so what so these applications like let us say yeah, let us say forest fire the example that i was giving you earlier right so if you are talking about i do not know how many of you are from andhra pradesh over here but several years back uh, if you remember you must have Start. Even if you are not from Andhra Pradesh, you must have heard that one of their chief ministers, basically, they are, uh, you know, in the in a bad weather condition, the uh, the helicopter basically crashed in one of the forests, right, in Andhra Pradesh, and uh, rescue operations uh, was very difficult, not only because of the bad weather conditions, but also that because of the dense forest, it was difficult, right. But you know, if let us say we had the sensor net network technology matured enough. Uh, at that time, then you can fly another helicopter, which will throw away the small cheap sensor devices on the ground, and uh, then they will self-configure. They they will, you know, they will start their network on their own, right? And uh, then uh, you know, so these uh, rescue operations will become easier, right? This is desirable. This is one of the applications. Like this, actually, there are so many different applications that are there where you need to really scale up beyond. Like tens of nodes, right? You need to go into hundreds or thousands, right? So how do you deal with it? It's, I mean, so I do not have an uh, uh, answer for it uh, because it is still in the research stages, and a lot of lot of research works are being carried on. Everybody tries to come up with this solution which is superior to the other, and so on, right? So this is like common, commonly whatever happens in research. Okay. Okay. So the other challenge is basically quality of service. Quality of service from a network point of view means like you want to offer some kind of a guarantee uh, in terms of bandwidth uh, or delay or jitter or packet loss probability, etc. So offering some kind of a guarantee in terms of the network quality of service uh, uh, is very difficult, right? It's very difficult in these kind of environments where wherever these nodes are deployed because these environments are uh, you know, these have very uh, uh, difficult uh, kind of, uh, you know, very challenging channel characteristics, RF channel characteristics. So these uh, channels basically, they have unpredictable changes. Uh, they go to unpredictable changes in their characteristics. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the network also is highly uh, limited in terms of bandwidth, right? So these are, so how do you offer in this kind of constrained environment, how do you offer uh, guarantees in terms of uh, minimum, let us say, this much of bandwidth will be available uh, to the users at all points, right? So this one, this kind of guarantee is very difficult. Right? So quality of service guarantees is a difficult, uh, difficult thing. So another research challenge is basically energy efficiency. I think energy efficiency is something that you know everybody uh, has tried to uh, get some success on. Uh, so energy efficiency means like you know so here actually because it's a multi-hop network you not only have nodes which will have to do their own uh, little tasks that they are programmed to do but also they have to cooperate with the other nodes because here you do not have a centralized network entity or manager who will do the network coordination and so on right so you uh, you know every node has to participate as a host as well as a relay right so uh, you know so that means that whenever you want to relay somebody else's packets uh, or uh, other other data units, if you have to relay uh, those, then you need to consume your own energy. So, so you know, so why would a node want to consume his or, uh, or consume its own energy uh, in order to cooperate with other nodes? What are the benefits of it, right? So there may not be any apparent benefit, but at the same time, if these nodes they do not cooperate due to these reasons, then the entire network is also going to collapse. So. Uh, so this is again another challenge. Uh, so here actually there are a lot of reputation-based schemes that have been uh, reputation-based schemes. Uh, and then um, what is it called? Um, and different mechanisms of cooperation basically. Different mechanisms of cooperation have been formulated uh, in order to encourage these nodes to cooperate. Right. So if basically you know if I cooperate, uh, basically there are some incentives that I'm going to get. Right. So that's uh, that's uh, something that. Um, 
uh, you know, so that actually a lot of research works have been done. Then comes the security. Basically, you know, any wireless network basically is prone to a lot of different types of attacks because it's an open medium. Uh, nodes are prone to malicious attacks, infiltration, eavesdropping, etc. Uh, plus, uh, you know, in these resource con uh, constrained environment, really you cannot uh, run your uh, existing, uh, you know, security mechanisms like, you know, RSA or PKI, etc. You know, so those, because those are basically resource consuming, right? Highly resource consuming. So here actually you need some kind of a lightweight kind of system to secure your network. So, you know, so uh, coming back, so I talked about the sensor node. Now, whenever you are talking about IoT, uh, so IoT, uh, most of the IoT nodes are basically transducers, right? So they convert, they take some input signal, then they convert into some other energy form, right? So, uh, so these uh, sensor, you know, if you have a sensor, basically sensor is also a transducer, actuator is also a transducer. So these uh, sensors, they, they are going to take some input signals and then they are going to send to the processor. The processor will uh, process the signal, right? And uh, based on the results, probably, you know, there will be some kind of an actuation that is going to take place. So this is typically the end-to-end -end kind of uh, framework that is experienced in IoT. So a uh, lot of different communication protocols have also been proposed uh, for use in IoT networks. Um, you know, there are standards like 802.15.4, uh, different other, um, you know, uh, protocols uh, and uh, different other technologies which base on uh, 802.15.4 standard like Zigbee, uh, wireless hard, Z-Wave, etc. So like this, actually, there are many different communication protocols uh, that have been proposed, right? Some are based on 802.15.4, some based on something else, right? So uh, anyone knows what is Bluetooth based on which standard? Eight not 2.11, so 7B. Okay. Okay. So, so like this, actually, there are so many different communication protocols that are uh, available. So now, let us quickly have a look through. Uh, we are almost, uh, yeah, so I just have uh, some 10, 15 minutes with me. So let me now switch my gear and uh, come to uh, the different works that we have been doing in the SMAN lab, right? So one of the works which has been primarily theoretical in nature, although we got some prototype implementations, is basically this uh, sensor cloud. Right. So in the same way as, uh, you know, earlier on, we talked about IoT cloud. Here, actually, in sensor cloud, we are talking about something called offering sensor services, uh, sensing as a service, basically, sensing as a service, right? So we all know about computers, uh, you know, computer virtualization, you know, so computing resource virtualization, computing as a service, right? Computing is, as a service is offered to these cloud computing technologies. So in the same way as cloud does computing as a service, we are talking about sensor cloud, which has to do, which we are proposing, will have, uh, you know, sensing as a service, right? So uh, this is what you typically have. At the very bottom, you have different, uh, you know, physical sensor nodes that are de deployed. And these physical sensor nodes, they will have to, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 they sense the data. And uh, these data will have to be processed, right? So the data will have to be processed. So how do you process the data and how do you make it available? How do you make the results of the processing available to the intended stakeholders? So for certain applications, it has been found that, you know, if, if uh, a particular owner, uh, if a particular person has to uh, use a, uh, you know, or a, if a particular person needs some kind of a sensor service, then, uh, traditionally, they would have to uh, procure the sensor devices, uh, then uh, deploy the network, maintain the network, and so on. So like that, you know, everybody has to do the same, right? But uh, for certain applications, it has been found out that you really need to, uh, do not need to, uh, you know, procure separate, separate networks and you uh, have to uh, deploy them. So it is not required. So what you can do is that there will be some sensor cloud service providers who will be offering the sensor data as a service. And all you need to do is to subscribe through uh, some portal in the same way as you have cloud-based portals also. Here, actually, you will be subscribing through some portal and you will be able to enjoy this different sensor data. 
Now, this technology is very attractive. I will tell you that a lot of uh, awards uh, we have got, a lot of success, a lot of research papers we have got in ITP transactions, etc. But the thing is that this scenario of uh, offering sensing as a service has limited applicability. Not in all scenarios we can use sensing as a service, right? So there are certain limitations of it. So if you are interested uh, to know more about uh, Sensor Cloud, <clears throat> go to Google Scholar and search with my name with Sensor Cloud or Sensor as a Service, and then you will be able to uh, get a lot of idea and also about the limitations that are there uh, along with these uh, technologies, right? So this is what Sensor Cloud talks about. So typically, uh, you know, this is kind of, uh, this is one of the base papers that you can use it uh, as. So on theoretical modeling of sensor cloud is the paper that was published in the IT systems journal by us. Um, and in this particular paper, it was published, if I remember, it was in 2014 or 15, something like that. Uh, so I forgot to mention the year over here. Uh, so this particular paper uh, basically gives you some of the foundational concepts uh, that we have proposed in the context of sensor cloud. Right, so um, uh, yeah, and we have also given the theoretical modeling. The advantage is that, uh, you know, so we were the ones to give the first theoretical model for sensor cloud. And the advantage is that the moment somebody has the theoretical model, further research becomes very easy, right? So we have provided that foundational uh, work that will be required to carry on uh, different uh, analysis with uh, sensor cloud. Right? <clears throat> So this is the scenario that you have, uh, you know, there is some kind of a user organization, uh, you know, so there are different applications that are running uh, on top and uh, user logs in uh, and uh, through some kind of a browser interface connects to the network and uh, then the sensed data is basically received by the user, right, so the user can access the sensed data, right, and this is a very simplistic view of uh, the sensor cloud. So is then, the data uh, processed also, or is it just raw data that is being shared with it? You can do whatever. You know? So for us, actually, we were not processing, but you can, you know, so if, so this is, you know, so we do not, so, you know, if required, it, it, it can be processed, right? So it can be extended, basically. You know? So we do not process. We are just enabling the technology, but, you know, simple uh, processing can definitely be done. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there are different things that uh, you know we have done and can could be done. Uh, so uh, like you know data aggregation is something. So you were talking about this processing, right? So you could do data aggregation. Uh, so uh, different things like energy management, QoS, you know, then uh, you know, sensor scheduling, and uh, like that. Actually, there are so many different problems that have been identified. And, uh, we have also worked on a couple of them, and there are many others that remain. Uh, unaddressed yet so anybody wants to take up research on sensor cloud uh, may be able to uh, you know, do uh, or continue the research that we have been doing so there are so many different problems theoretical modeling we have done you know uh, composition of virtual sensor so ultimately you know what happened is that you have different uh, virtual sensor nodes right so these virtual sensor nodes if you aggregate these virtual sensor nodes in certain composition so ultimately you know what you are going to get is uh, some advanced levels of services at the application end, right? So uh, these are possible, um, you know, optimal, how we can optimally, you can, uh, you know, you can put this or integrate these different virtual sensor nodes. Uh, caching is a very important thing because let us say temperature, right? So let us say that, you know, you have a sensor network, a sensor cloud network, uh, which uh, does, uh, you know, temperature sensing, right? So temperature is such a thing which doesn't change rapidly over time. So each and every unit, if you want to relate and offer, you know, that, that will be more resource consuming. So instead, you know, what you could do is you can cache the data and if only if there is a change in the data, then only you know, it can be made available uh, to the users, right? So you are saving on the overall network or system bandwidth. So like this actually pricing is also a very interesting thing. You know, a lot of work has been done on pricing. Uh, one of the earliest works was done by one of my PhD students, Dynamic Optical Pricing for Heterogeneous Service Oriented Architecture for Sensor Cloud Infrastructure in IT Transactions on Services Computing. So here actually, uh, you know, so we come up with a pricing model, uh, you know, so which could be adopted, uh, 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 you know, so it's a network pricing model basically, which could be adopted in order to uh, use these sensor services or, or offer these sensor services. 
Very quickly, I'm going to run you through a couple of other words. So as I was telling you that we have a lot of footprint on healthcare. So one of the basic components of networking is the wireless body area network, right? In the context of healthcare. So wireless body area network is something like, you know, a human uh, uh, being or a patient basically uh, wears different physiological sensors. And these physiological sensors could be ECG sensor, EEG sensor, airflow sensor, you know, temp body temperature sensor, blood pressure sensor, like that actually there are so many different sensors that are commercially available in the market. So you, you, you use these small wearable sensors and these sensors, they would be networked in a certain form. The data would be sent to uh, some local processing hub like a smartphone or something. And from that smartphone, the data could be sent to the cloud for further processing, storage, et cetera, right? So this is how the wireless body area networks are formed. So these body area networks would be used for uh, serving different uh, healthcare applications, right? So different healthcare applications. So, uh, so this is what I was talking about. So you have different physiological sensor nodes that uh, you know, the patient wears, and these nodes they send uh, the sensed data to the local processing hub, and uh, from this local processing hub, the data could be sent elsewhere. Uh, so, uh, so you you know, see so here we are talking about intra W band communication. Intra means inside, right? So intra W band communication. Like this, you know, if you consider different W bands, you can have inter W band communication. So there are different access points that will have to get come into the picture and how you are going to make this entire network, etc. So for inter W band, you have technologies such as Zigbee, uh, it's zero point three point four, the one that I was telling you earlier, or there is even a better one which is called eight zero two point fifteen point six, which is completely dedicated to healthcare applications. So this is another standard, 0 to 0 0.15.6 for healthcare applications. And for, uh, you know, interband uh, communication, you have Wi-Fi, cellular, et cetera. So there are so many different research challenges here as well, uh, like dynamic channel conditions, right? So you, you know, you, you are talking about patient who moves continuously, uh, you know, limb movements are there, not only limb movements, but also the entire body movement and so on and so forth. So you have a completely dynamic channel characteristic and sometimes you also have, uh, you know, these nodes which are going to form the topology and break the topology continuously in real time. So how do you take care of this kind of network, right? So dynamic channel con uh, conditions, then reliability is very important because you are talking about healthcare, it should not happen that somebody is getting a heart attack and the packet, packet gets dropped, right? Reliability is very important. Heterogeneity of sensor devices, so I was earlier telling you that many of these devices that are used in IoT systems, et cetera, these are made by different vendors following different standards, uh, you know, which use different protocols. They, you know, all of these standards, devices, protocols, et cetera, they do not as such talk to each other. So how do you make them talk to each other you know, while keeping in mind that there is the criticality of these sensor data. So the sensor data cannot drop, you cannot really uh, you know, you cannot really uh, prefer one type of data over another unless you have a certain medical condition in place, etc. So like that, actually, for fairness, etc., you need to have some kind of a fairness ensuring scheme. So like that, actually, there are so many different other research challenges as well. So considering all of these, uh, you know, we came up with uh, different works have been done. Um, you know, so one of my students who is currently a faculty somewhere. So ITP transactions on wireless communication in 2015, we have published this work on priority-based, uh, you know, priority-based data rate tuning, data rate tuning. So basically, you know, what happens is that there are so many, you know, so to this local hub, uh, there are so many different nodes which are trying to connect, right? At the same time, somebody, uh, somebody is getting a heart attack and has a temperature and all of these things. So which packet should be given priority, which one not, right? So like that, actually, there are, there is a game formulation uh, you know, NAS bargaining game formulation that has been made and uh, it has been solved. And uh, you know, so, um, uh, so this particular work, if you look through, you'll be able to get some idea about what we have done. So like this, actually, uh, I'm skipping all of these in the interest of time. Uh, like this, actually, there is a, another stream of works that have been done uh, on nano sensor networks. Uh, so earlier, whatever we were talking about is uh, basically, you know, macro scale networks, right? So nano sensor networks talks about in a nano scale in the human body, for example, you know, so these different uh, sensors that are going to be there are going to be injected into the bloodstream, for example, or are going to be deployed uh, in certain locations of the human body. And, uh, you know, so uh, these sensors, you know, they can uh, self-organize, they can 
do, do, do their things on their own. They can communicate and they can continuously monitor the condition uh, inside the human body. Right. So nanosensor networks are very popular, and we have here actually we have done a lot of work, lot of work using you know electromagnetic communication, using molecular communication, bacterial nano networks. Even one of my students presently, um, uh, she uh, so first of all she did some work on. Uh, nano communication for dengue virus, right? So viral viral transmission inside the human body. So for dengue virus, she did. Then uh, during the pandemic time, very recently, another IEEE injection paper came out where she proposed uh, a solution uh, for uh, modeling of uh, transmission of COVID-19 virus inside the human body, right? So that also became very popular. So like that, actually, a lot of different works uh, are possible. Both on the electromagnetic aspects of communication as well as the molecular communication. So these are the challenges that we experience and we have worked upon are listed over here. Again, you know, in the in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through them. Uh, so let me skip all of these. These are actually some of our solutions only, and uh, I'm not going to go through them. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. So let me skip this one too, and let me come to this one. UAV networks, right? So UAV is, uh, you know, so I, I think you know everybody knows what uh, a UAV is, right? So um, you know unmanned aerial vehicles. So you must have heard about drones. So the drones basically are like flying helicopters where there is no, you know, these are unmanned flying helicopters, right? So uh, they come in different types. So there can be quadcopters, octocopters, etc or there could be fixed wing uh, drones, et cetera. So like that, you know, so the, these drones, they themselves can be flown uh, in isolation uh, alone. They can be flown or they can be networked uh, together in order to fly them. So they, they have different interesting features. Um, you know, so they typically form an ad hoc network infrastructure, uh, infrastructure less network, ad hoc network is typically formed. However, you know, so infrastructure based network can also be formed as, you know, as it is written over here. So, so like that, actually, there are different things, you know, you can do with the networking of the drones, right? So this is a picture that I have uh, taken, you know, so all of our, so we have done a lot of work on UAVs and UAV networks, and we have put everything on YouTube, right? So if you search with uh, Drone Squared, Swan Group, IIT Kharagpur, like that, if you search, you will be able to find plenty of videos. So I'm not going to play these videos because they are going to consume time. But uh, what I wanted to show you is this is actually from our helipad in IIT Kharagpur. Uh, so we used to do our experiments over there. So this is like two, uh, you know, so two, two nodes in a network, right? Two nodes in a UAV network. So we started with two nodes, then we scaled up into three nodes, four nodes, and so on. So uh, like that. Okay. So yeah. Uh, so this is basically this fan sensor node. Uh, you know, so we do not use it anymore because nowadays these open hardware platforms are available. But traditionally, we started with building uh, our own IoT node. Uh, the sensor node and uh, we still uh, use it for certain applications like in agricultural application that we have we still have this node being used but uh, most of the modern applications that we are working on we have replaced this node with uh, uh, with this open hardware uh, platform based nodes uh, that can be developed very fast these are actually more expensive and uh, developing them uh, takes a lot of time ambusense is a healthcare uh, application uh, that we have used of IoT. So basically, in our country, what happens is that patients will have to be taken from a rural healthcare center uh, to a city hospital, right? If the condition of the patient is such that it cannot be treated in a primary healthcare center or a rural healthcare center, the patient will have to be taken for uh, taken in an ambulance. And you know, many times it's not an ambulance, also it's like a simple, uh, you know, omni van or something like that. There is no paramedic and uh, so on. Right. And for several hours, the patient will have to be taken uh, from this primary health care center to the city hospital. And this journey uh, typically is in the order of like three hours, four hours, five hours, and even more sometimes, right? So, uh, you know, if it is such a long journey, uh, then uh, many times, you know, what happens is the condition of the patient is not monitored at all by any professional. So by the time the patient reaches the destination hospital, the patient dies, right? Or the severity of the ailment basically increases. So we came up with a solution by which the, the doctors uh, at both the ends, uh, so they are going to continuously monitor the condition of the patient being uh, you know, taken in the ambulance. 
and uh, you know so if there is some kind of an intervention that will have to be given uh, the doctor can um, basically give this expert uh, guidance so this what uh, has been popular it has been uh, published uh, uh, you know it has been published in uh, some it literature it has been the patents have been filed and uh, so like that actually it is already uh, you know being uh, you know its derivative basically uh, the, uh, its derivative is, in, is being used for um, uh, for commercialization like that actually we are working on the different aspects of ambitions in agriculture also we have a footprint these are some real pictures of our deployed systems right uh, this is basically a water level sensor that we have developed in house right so these are from our agricultural fields where these nodes are different nodes are deployed these are energy harvesting nodes so these are solar powered and energy harvesting they can run on their own so like this actually there are some simulators also right? so and also we have worked on underwater acoustic nodes right so we have developed our own low cost acoustic node uh, so typical most of most of these uh, modems basically which are used underwater have to be imported and typically most of these modems they cost like you know 5 to 6 lakhs or sometimes even 7 lakhs or even more right so we wanted to come up with a very low cost indianized version of uh, these uh, uh, modems and uh, we started doing that uh, we had some success uh, we were able to get some uh, level of success in the form of performance etc but then uh, you know some some parts of the system basically doesn't perform very well uh, so uh, so this is but uh, the good part is that this uh, this system once it starts being functional it can uh, you know it's very very cheap right so developing this node basically will take a couple of thousand rupees only right and uh, it's not too bad but it's little inferior to the commercially available systems some of these uh, books actually yeah so uh, professor uh, disuja uh, she mentioned about two books which i have not uh, put over here i forgot to change this slide uh, so there are two two new books if you are interested one cambridge university press uh, published by cambridge university press uh, available on amazon uh, you know it's introduction to iot uh, if you are interested uh, please uh, you know uh, feel free to buy a copy of the book it is available through amazon.in or probably there are many other uh, sites from where you can buy there is another one which is introduction to internet of things and industry 4.0 uh, published by crc press us and it is also available now uh, it is also available through amazon and a uh, few other websites so if you are not able to uh, find uh, any of these books let me know and uh, i will be happy to share with you so some of these media coverage and all of these stuffs right so different national newspapers even in the you know televised media also you know we have uh, we were uh, telecasted okay so the most this is the most important slide the reason being that uh, you know so whatever i go and present you know so most of these things have not been done exclusively by me, myself right so these are the uh, these these are the people these are the students who actually do the work and i am the one who go and present right so uh, so the credit basically most of the credit goes to these students who who make things happen in real life so thank you um, thank you professor disuja over to you yeah thanks a lot professor sudhi thank you very much